Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our final day of the Conservative Progressive Summit. My name is Joe Hogan. I'm a graduate student at New York University and also the host of the Howenstein Center's Common Ground podcast. I'm going to start things off for us this morning by introducing Martha Jones, whose presentation is titled Toward an Intellectual History of Black Women and Back. Martha Jones is professor of history and Afro-American and African studies at the University of Michigan, where she is a presidential bicentennial professor and directs the program in race, law, and history at the law school. However, Professor Jones just told me that this summer she's moving to Johns Hopkins University to serve as the SOBA presidential professor in the history department there. Professor Jones's scholarly interests include the history of race, citizenship, slavery, and the rights of women in the United States. She holds a PhD in history from Columbia and a JD from the CUNY School of Law. Prior to joining the Michigan faculty, she was a public interest litigator in New York City and a Charles H. Revson Fellow on the future of the city of New York at Columbia University. Professor Jones is the author of All Bound Up Together, The Woman Question in African American Public Culture, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2007. She was also co-editor of Toward an Intellectual History of Black Women, published in 2015. Most recently, Professor Jones authored Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, forthcoming from Cambridge in 2017. Her articles have appeared in journals such as the Law and History Review and the American Journal of Legal History, as well as in numerous edited collections. Professor Jones has held fellowships from the National Humanities Center, the National Constitution Center, the Gilder Lerman Institute, the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and the Library Company of Philadelphia. Her commentary on race, law, and history can be found at CNN, The Huffington Post, History News Network, and many other places. Please join me in welcoming our very distinguished speaker, Professor Martha Jones. Good morning, my early morning diehards. Good to see you all. Thanks for coming out. Um, I want to thank Joe Hogan um, for the introduction, but also for introducing me to uh, the Common Ground Initiative and the Howenstein Center. Um, and I want to thank everybody here for um, a very fascinating um, couple of days. I know we still have more um, interesting conversation ahead of us. Um, but one of my reflections has been about um, the degree to which this sort of initiative like Common Ground uh, might require us both to um, put together in the room um, folks of uh, disparate points of view, um, folks who occupy disparate places along a political spectrum, um, but might also uh, require us to think about um, the ethics, um, the values that we bring to how we engage one another. Um, one of the more um, interesting things I'll take away from this meeting um, is my informal conversations with many of you about the phenomena of mansplaining. Um, I have <laughs> learned a lot um, about this idea um, this weekend, and I will also take that away um, as part of my reflection. So thank you again for having me here. What I'm going to talk about, the piece I'm going to talk about today, um, I hope, pulls together in a somewhat perhaps unexpected or somewhat unorthodox way uh, many of the threads that have been running through our conversations to this point. Um, ideology, uh, politics, identity, and history. Um, and I'm going to do it through um, a vignette that will be, I hope, somewhat familiar to you, the 2008 a democratic primary contest between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Um, but I do so, um, I hope ultimately, to um, dispel the notion that there are simple um, dichotomies or easy boxes um, into which we can put um, a um, complex a political moment as that. And then I'll end by just saying a little bit about the afterlife of some of this work um, and some of the special challenges that I've come to associate with um, the work on writing the intellectual history of African American. I'll ask you in the end if that, um, African American women, um, I'll ask you at the end if that might not in fact be um, in some sense an oxymoron. 
So in the midst of the highly contested primary campaign between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, an alternative candidate made a brief appearance. Feminist activist Gloria Steinem introduced the figure of Achola Obama, a candidate whose personal biography mirrored that of Barack. Achola was, as Steinem described her, a lawyer, community organizer, parent of two girls, child of a white American mother and black African father, experienced state legislator, and inspirational voice. She was in every respect a counterpart to the former Illinois senator, except Achola was a woman. Inventing the character of Achola, Steinem hoped that the contrast between the actual male candidate and an imaginary female would persuade readers that all else being equal, it was gender that made it unlikely that Achola would become a US senator and candidate for the presidency. Achola's femaleness, Steinem argued, rendered her candidacy impossible, while her male counterpart, Barack, appeared poised to take the Democratic Party's nomination. Her message, race, was likely to trump gender in 2008. It was a cynical move, one that erased black women from political culture, even as it purported to champion their interests. Steinem never invited readers to contemplate how Achola herself might have explained her failed candidacy. Shut out were the ideas of black women who explained their position in the Obama-Clinton contest and in politics generally as intersectional and thus incapable of being reduced to race or gender. Commentators were eager to explain the Clinton-Obama contest in race versus gender terms. The New York Times published first Steinem and then feature writer Mark Leibovich, each attempting to explain how identity shaped political culture. Their starting place was history. Steinem's January 2008 op-ed, Women Are Never Forerunners, asked why is the sex barrier not taken as seriously as the racial one? She looked to history for answers. Quote, the abolition and suffrage movements progressed when united and were damaged by division. We should remember that. Steinem went on then to read the terms of the 15th Amendment to conclude, again, quote, black men were given the vote a half century before women of any race were allowed to mark a ballot. Less than one week later, Leibovich authored a feature piece, Rights versus Rights, an improbable collision course that relied on the, quote, bitter case of the abolitionist women's rights split to explain how race had trumped gender. Blacks won the right to vote with the 15th Amendment in 1870, while women won theirs decades later in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment, Leibovitch suggested. These analyses proceeded as if all African Americans were men and all the women were white. Nowhere was there an accounting of how black women had been positioned in 19th century politics, and the result was a misleading picture of the past. The political community referenced was the post-Civil War American Equal Rights Association. The AERA included activists who had simultaneously advocated for the abolition of slavery and the rights of women, understanding oppression justified by race and gender to be equally irrational. What we remember as a distinct women's suffrage movement was founded in 1869, only after a series of debates over the terms of the 14th and 15th Amendments. Even then, there never emerged one unified women's movement. Instead, two organizations were born, the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association, and the latter remained committed to both the cause of African American political and civil rights and to women's suffrage. The invocation of an abolitionist women's suffrage split may have been expedient for the purpose of political provocation in 2008, but it bore little resemblance to the complex past that it played upon. A look at the history of African American women may have helped commentators. It also would have made plain how black women had never reduced their political identities to race or gender. The alliances between abolitionism and women's rights were never forged by white women and black men alone. 
African American women worked alongside figures like Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, two figures who too frequently stand in for the whole. For example, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, a poet and anti-slavery lecturer, was among the black women who took part in the AERA meetings. Her analysis of American politics was expressed during an 1866 meeting, and she did not pit women against black people or race against gender. Instead, Harper urged, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity. Harper argued that injustice flowed from race and sex, and that as a black woman, she embodied that political crossroads. With Harper in mind, the lessons of the 1860s are not only about the errors of political divisions. They are lessons that refute an essentialist claim about how identity maps onto political positions and about the necessity for an intersectional perspective that understands race and gender as embodied in Harper's black femaleness as always and necessarily linked. On the 15th Amendment, only a constrained and formalistic reading of the history of voting rights could lead to the sort of distorted conclusions offered up by Steinem and Leibovitch. The 15th Amendment did not guarantee voting rights for all black people. Black women remained formally disfranchised after 1870 as women. In subsequent decades, they campaigned for women's suffrage, sometimes alongside white women, while also challenging Jim Crow era racial oppression in campaigns against segregation, lynching, and the disfranchisement of all black Americans. African American men exercised the right to vote in significant numbers during Reconstruction's brief experiment in interracial democracy. However, by the 1890s, they were targets of violence, legislation and custom that successfully crushed their numbers at the polls and their influence in political culture. Even after 1920, black women remained disfranchised under the South's Jim Crow regime, and no voting rights saga would be complete without consideration of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That act marked the end of a nearly 100 year long contest waged by black men and women Steinem and Leibovitch elided the overwhelming weight of the historical record. Never in our history were these simply differences between black men and white women. And for understanding the views of today's diverse electorate, such paradigms are ill-fitting and just plain irrelevant. If commentators could overlook black women as historical actors, it was, not an e it was not so easy to overlook them as real members of the body politic in 2008. Steinem was challenged by many, including uh, Melissa Lacewell Harris, today Melissa Harris Perry. Lacewell Harris's confrontation with Steinem took place during a broadcast television exchange on Democracy Now! Scholar of political science and African American studies, Lacewell Harris drew additional authority from having worked with Obama in Chicago and spent, having spent weeks in the field with his presidential campaign. But she also spoke directly as a black woman. Quote, I'm sitting here in my black womanhood body knowing that it's more complicated. She was appalled and offended by Steinem's essay and she echoed what was a popular reaction. We've got to get clear about the fact that race and gender are not these clear dichotomies in which you know you're a woman or you're black. She questioned Steinem's underlying premise that black men were standing over and above white women. The relative numbers in Congress suggested the inverse. An intersectional analysis was required, Lacewell Harris insisted. Quote, maybe if we look through the prism of black women's experience and not just try to use black women's experience as a kind of, you know, look at how much harder it is for women, but instead to really try and understand that intersectional experience, I think we'd come to a clearer perspective. Steinem's only response was to agree. Lacewell Harris was one voice in a groundswell. Online comment sections lit up with lessons for Steinem, lessons offered up by black women about their relationship to the body politic. Commentators challenged first and foremost the erasures of black women's ideas. By 5.32 p.m. on the afternoon that Steinem's op-ed was posted, 
YBF, who provocatively reported her location as invisible, commented on the New York Times online version. Quote, as a young black female attorney who voted for Hillary to become a senator, I'm highly offended by this piece. Am I supposed to vote for Hillary because she's a woman, but not Obama because he is black? Steinem and a lot of white feminists, frankly, fail to see the intersection of race and gender and therefore do not acknowledge me and my experience in their analysis and rhetoric. Black women needed neither a university post nor a television camera to weigh in. In the blogosphere, they claimed their presence in the marketplace of political ideas. They variously wondered, queried, insisted, lamented, and preached in the face of the incapacity of the New York Times to recognize their position and grapple with their perspective. Dear Gloria, ain't I a woman too? Wrote Tamara Winfrey Harris on Blog Her, invoking the often quoted words of 19th century activist Sojourner Truth. An entry on Angry Black Woman signed by Nora asked, which came first, my uterus or my skin? Ms. Steinem's arguments for why sexism trumps racism ignores those of us who are women of color, wrote Pam Spaulding on her Pam's House Blend, always steaming. Shark Fu wrote on Angry Black Bitch in a post titled, I'm worried too, Ms. Steinem, that after reading Steinem's op-ed, I felt invisible, as if black and woman can't exist in the same body. What neither Steinem nor Leibovitch appeared to anticipate was that black women might retell history by drawing upon their own stories, illuminating the puzzle of race, gender, and the dynamics of American politics. What might give us pause here is that Steinem does not appear to have anticipated the terms of her confrontation with Lacewell Harris. The evidence of black women's histories that so powerfully undermined her race-gender dichotomy was, in a sense, plain to see. It was there in the work of scholars, in lived experience, and in the popular consciousness of black women. The evidence was also in the campaign itself. The presence of Lacewell Harris in precincts in Iowa and New Hampshire, for example, was a sign that Steinem need not have left her pundit's perch to discern that black women were more than fictional devices. They were well-armed, sophisticated agents of political culture who aimed to shape the outcome of the presidential campaign and to do so by their own terms. If Steinem managed to overlook the voices of most black women, she remained hard-pressed to bracket out figures like Oprah Winfrey, Donna Brazile, Toni Morrison, and Michelle Obama, who by 2008 were too prominent to overlook. As they worked to shape the election and our analysis of it, these women offered up an alternative view. They rejected the view of race and gender as an ill-fated dichotomy in politics and spoke to the nation through their black womanhood bodies and minds. Along the way, some began to craft political theories. Oprah Winfrey, television personality, media mogul, and philanthropist, joined Barack Obama on the campaign trail at the end of 2007. Her presence helped to draw enormous crowds to public rallies while generating an excitement that carried over from meeting halls into American living rooms. It was a first for Winfrey taking the political podium, and she th knew that many observers questioned her presence. Winfrey put that question squarely on the table for one audience. At last, I'm here, she told a, told a group in Des Moines. She would leave the pundits to parse the meaning of her presence completely, but she went ahead to explain her sense of belonging to the body politic as an African-American woman. Quote, when you strip us all down, when you take away our race, our color, our ethnicity, our backgrounds, our sex, when you strip us all down, we are Americans at our core. Winfrey's invocation of a political ideal blind to difference allowed her to resolve the race versus sex dichotomy posited by Steinem and Leibovitch. These markers of social different were not at odds in Winfrey's view. Instead, they could be acknowledged and then dispensed with. Winfrey was not alone. Black women spoke in a sort of chorus of intersectionality. Political analyst and Democratic Party leader Donna Brazile took a somewhat different view. But she also resisted the argument that her blackness and her womanhood were irreconcilable. In a spring 2008 exchange over the character of the Democratic Party, Brazile chided, 
quote, just don't tell me that I can't stand in Hillary's camp because I'm black, and I can't stand in Obama's camp because I'm female, because I'm both, and I'm grumpy, and might go with McCain. Brazil's point was twofold. There was nothing essential about her politics as a black woman, and party analysts ought not to underestimate the extent to which black women might enact a political agency that defied easy dichotomies of race and sex. Toni Morrison's words, while more subtle, were no less clear. In an open letter to candidate Obama, she rejected a simplified politics of identity. Like Winfrey, it was Morrison's first time endorsing a political candidate. She knew her views might be essentialized. Of Clinton, Morrison explained she, quote, cared little for her gender. While she did not much care, care very much for Obama's race, Morrison distanced herself from Steinem's dichotomy and then invoked a politics without, quote, age, experience, race, or gender. She called it wisdom. History emerged as a powerful tool in these rethinkings of black women's place in political culture and 19th century US history, the history that so concerned Steinem and Leibovitch took center stage. When Michelle Obama took the podium at the 2008, August 2008 Democratic National Convention, she came armed with an ambitious arsenal. Obama's speech, um, one that has come back to us more recently as having been borrowed from by Mrs. Trump, but Obama's speech drew upon childhood reminiscences, moral philosophy, and her role as mother, and turned on a view of the American dream as produced through struggle and determination. Struggle was part of our history, she suggested, and Mrs. Obama plays the occasion of her speech squarely into a historical frame. This week, we celebrate two anniversaries, she said, the 88th anniversary of women winning the right to vote and the 45th anniversary of that hot summer day when Dr. King lifted our sights and our hearts with his dream for our nation. Mrs. Obama claimed two histories, the history of gender as represented by the passage of the 19th Amendment and the history of race as expressed through the civil rights movement. She continued, I stand here today at the cross currents of that history, knowing that my piece of the American dream is a blessing hard won by those who came before me. Mrs. Obama took her audience back to the dichotomy set forth by Steinem and Leibovitch and then mapped out the intersections, or in her terms, cross currents, that expressly ran through her black womanhood body. In Obama's vision of American political culture, she was the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Frederick Douglass, and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was also a daughter of Martin Luther King Jr., Gloria Steinem, and Ella Baker. Race and sex in her analysis was not a fraught dyad or risky political categories, were, or were not uh, risky political categories of analysis. They were the lived experience of African American women. In an echo of Steinem, Hillary Clinton, who had tried to avoid confronting head on the problem of the race sex dyad, was drawn into the debate. In her address to the DNC convention, Clinton also turned to the past to explain how Democrats, particularly her women supporters, could see their way to backing Barack Obama in the general election. She offered a vision that might reconcile the race-gender divide. Clinton began by invoking a touchstone that Michelle Obama had already held up, that of the 19th Amendment's 88th anniversary. She explained, I'm a United States Senator because in 1848, a group of courageous women and a few brave men gathered in Seneca Falls, New York to participate in the first convention on women's rights in our history. 88 years ago on this day, the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote was enshrined in our Constitution. Until this point, and I remember vividly watching this moment, until this point, Clinton seemed wedded to the script that Steinem and Leibovitch had sketched out. She invoked the rights of women and allied herself with the figure of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. What about race? Could Hillary Clinton navigate that fraught dichotomy? Clinton took the plunge and attempted to traverse the race-sex dyad. She continued, how do we give the country back to courageous Americans who defy the odds by following the example of a brave New Yorker? At this point, we might have expected her to invoke Frederick Douglass, who spent many years of his life in upstate Rochester. 
but Clinton had learned from Steinem's self-inflicted strife. Instead, she continued, a woman who risked her life to bring slaves to freedom along the Underground Railroad. On that path to freedom, Harriet Tubman had one piece of advice. If you hear the dogs keep going, if you see the torches in the woods keep going, if you hear the dogs keep going, if, you, if they're shouting after you, keep going, don't ever stop, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. It was inspired political theater in the convention hall roared. Clinton had offered a resolution to the race sex divide and it came in the form of a black woman. Clinton's implicit pairing of two histories, that of Katie Stanton and of Tubman, argued that not all the women were white, nor were all the black people men. And for a moment, the possibilities for Democratic Party consensus and Barack Obama's election relied upon the wisdom of an African-American woman. Or did it? The following day, commentators scrutinized Clinton's remarks. Most appeared to know Tubman even prior to Clinton's speech. But while they knew of her courageous leadership among fugitive slaves, there emerged questions about the veracity of the quote. Did Harriet Tubman really say that, queried the New York Times. It was a curious inquiry that simultaneously undercut Tubman and the political candidate who invoked her. The answer, it turned out, was no. And a small group of historians had the last word on Clinton's attempt to mend the race gender rift in her party. It was an eerie parallel to Steinem's invention of Achola Obama. It turned out that Clinton too relied upon a fictionalized Harriet Tubman. Tubman had been the subject of recent historical study, generating three book-length scholarly biographies. One author, Milton Cernet, puzzled at Clinton's move to quote Tubman. Tubman had not been a literate person, and so much of what is attributed to her is highly mediated through others, he explained. But with respect to Clinton's specific quote, Cernet explained that it approximated a four-line quatrain attributed to Tubman. Unfortunately, despite being often repeated, particularly in children's literature, there was no evidence that Tubman had ever uttered such words. Historian Kate Larson suggested that the words were in the spirit of Tubman, who encouraged black and white women st to stick together to win the battle for the right to vote. Tubman herself was left somewhere between the historical and the fictional, reduced to a symbol for feminist ideas in giving women the right to vote. Tubman looked less and less like the intersectional figure that black women had promoted. These questions did not cease with Barack Obama's rise as the Democratic candidate or with his election to the presidency. Neither the finality of election night scenes of a triumphant Barack Obama nor the inauguration day spectacle of the new first couple parading through Washington resolved theories of irreconcilable dyads and enduring intersections. Two companion scenes from early 2009 suggest how the place of black women in political culture remained unsettled. Such questions still bubbled to the surface in new and curious ways. The first was in January 2009, when Ms. Magazine carried such questions into the post-election season. Barack Obama adorned the cover of Ms., depicted from the waist up with jacket open, jacket open tie unraveled, and white button-down shirt open to expose a black T-shirt. This superhero figure gazed with gravity into the distance, while the text on his t-shirt revealed his true agenda. This is what a feminist looks like. Commentators buzzed as they tried to reconcile the image of the new African-American male president with the feminist moniker. Was it a cruel jab at Clinton supporters? Was feminism post-women with men its super champions? Perhaps the cover meant to suggest that Barack Obama and not his wife Michelle would carry the legacy of campaigns for the rights of women into the future. In a post-essentialist world, perhaps black men could claim to be the rightful sons of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Ms. publisher Eleanor Smeal explained the cover in rather constrained terms. The aim was simply to, quote, capture both the national and feminist mood of high expectations and hope. No consensus emerged, but the image added a layer of complexity to the historical blueprint that had influenced the campaign. Perhaps here, Obama was no more than another fictionalized black body called into service to promote 
a feminist vision. Nearby, a black woman, Michelle Obama, was taking the public stage as First Lady. Many had speculated about her role would be in the White House, and she asserted that home and family would be her principal concerns during her husband's tenure. Still, listening in on Mrs. Obama as she began to preside over public occasions, we hear her returning to the questions about race and gender that had animated the previous season. In April 2009, Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton, now Secretary of State, reunited at the invitation of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. The occasion was the unveiling of a bust in the Capitol's Emancipation Hall. Sojourner Truth, the enslaved woman turns women's rights and anti-slavery activist, was being made part of the nation's collective memory. Amidst an elaborate ceremony, Mrs. Obama explained the occasion's significance in terms that were by now familiar to any student of U.S. political culture. Quote, Justice Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott would be pleased to know that we have a woman serving as Speaker of the House of Representatives. I hope that Sojourner Truth would be proud to see me, the descendant of slaves, serving as First Lady of the United States of America. So I am proud to be here. I am proud to be able to stand here on this day for this dedication. Now many young boys and girls like my own daughters will come to Emancipation Hall and see the face of a woman who looks like them. Her suggestion was a new one in this long debate about race, gender, and history in American politics. While we may be students of history, perhaps history is also watching us. Sojourner Truth stood just over Mrs. Obama's shoulder, literally in bust form and figuratively as a standard bearer from the past. Mrs. Obama suggested that we might be accountable to a historical past, even as, a, as we are left to sort out what that past might be. Her remarks departed from her summer 2008 analysis of history's cross currents. Instead, she drew a picture of two streams of American womanhood, one of white women and the other of black women and the descendants of slaves. Obama's black womanhood body, like the body of truth and those of her young daughters, was on that day memorialized as yet another touchstone for the forging of our political culture and the collective memories upon which it's built. I want to end with some reflections on um, the writing of this piece, but perhaps more importantly, uh, the reception of its ideas. I began work on this as part of uh, the Black Women's Intellectual and Cultural History uh, collective, um, the group that produced the volume toward an intellectual history of black women. And as is often the case, I was subject to good and challenging criticism um, on the early iterations of this essay because I began with a focus um, almost exclusively on what my colleagues termed elite African-American women. I was reading the ideas of people like Michelle Obama, Donna Brazile, Oprah Winfrey, Toni Morrison, and I was challenged to um, look um, in a different place, um, in a more um, grassroots place, um, what were ordinary African-American women um, thinking um, about this moment and about this contest? How did they position themselves? And I took that criticism seriously, seriously enough that I spent, as you've heard, um, time in the blogosphere um, using um, blogs and to some degree um, comment pages um, in the news to see if I couldn't get beyond elite women to um, understand how uh, more everyday women were also experiencing, understanding, analyzing, theorizing um, this political moment in 2008. Um, and it turned out to be, for me, a first in terms of um, a research strategy, but it turned out um, to be illuminating uh, because, in fact, what I found were um, mirrors, echoes, um, but not precisely the same um, as what I was hearing from elite women, and it really was worth incorporating into this essay in important ways. And I went out again to workshop this uh, piece and talk about it at professional meetings. Um, and 
um, again, um, I was um, challenged. Um, why was I uh, only writing about elite women? Um, elite women um, in American politics like Mrs. Obama um, or Donna Brazile, or elite women like those who um, take up um, the, uh, the blogosphere and express their ideas there. And I began to wonder um, if there wasn't something more afoot, um, a broader point of reflection on writing black women's intellectual history, um, one in which um, in some sense, my offense had been to try and pull um, black women's activism, black women's politics into the realm of intellectual history itself. Um, the history of political thought um, as um, for a long time th told through um, the lives of um, and the thought of elite white men, um, I had been suggesting that black women um, too were defining the nature of the body politic. And while I was hardly the first to do so, um, I think I struck a nerve um, in suggesting somehow um, that black women um, were of consequence in this realm. Um, I took this challenge to be um, one worth um, reflecting on, though I say that I don't think this essay wholly reflects that. Um, that there's an inherent tension um, between my field of African American history, which is expected um, to um, linger, to dwell, um, to illuminate um, some alternative space, um, some sort of counter public, um, a space of the grassroots, um, that there's something of a tension um, in terming that work intellectual history that transforms the same um, figures um, from uh, the subaltern into the elite um, just by virtue of the very um, framing. It's left me to reflect a lot on um, the archive itself. Um, where should we look? How do we look? Um, old questions in African American history um, are not um, are not um, eliminated when one moves into intellectual history, um, that the challenges of how to get um, beyond the pronouncements of elite women published in the New York Times or memorialized on YouTube, or even a realm like the blogosphere, um, perhaps a different sort of work to do um, to get at um, those grassroots women's ideas and to call that intellectual history as well. Um, but a real archival challenge. Um, but is there something um, ultimately oxymoronic in the notion of African American women's intellectual history um, to the degree that we cannot challenge um, the predominance of elite subjects um, through the ideas of black women um, without also transforming um, those women into elite subjects themselves. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you very much. And I believe I'm supposed to invite folks to uh, the microphones and uh, take questions, so. That's great. That's orchestrated. That's beautiful. <laughs> We practiced. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed. Um, I have to comment. I wonder, I wonder why there's a difference in our audience this morning from yesterday. So I just had to make that comment. Um, but that's not about your work. My question is about um, this phrase that you borrowed from Tani Coates, uh, black bodies, which I've noticed coming up in a lot of people's writing, and it's so striking to me because his book is relatively recent, huge impact, and then this phrase is so useful and resonant, and every time somebody uses it, I know that they know where they got it and that it's doing work for them. And so my question um, is about how you had to tweak 
the gender, because one of the criticisms he's gotten is that he, his very male perspective and not including female experience, and of course that's what you're talking about. And so I just, I just wondered like, what your thoughts were in adopting and adapting that resonant phrase. So thanks for that. Um, and it's interesting to think about this piece as partly um, mapping the genealogy of um, what is, um, I think you're right, most um, popularly or most commonly understood to be Coates's idea about the black body. But in fact, the phrase comes not from Coates, it comes from um, Melissa, Melissa Harris Perry um, in 2008. And her um, phrase to Steinem is, um, and her invocation to Steinem is about her black womanhood body. And it does, I think, open up, um, I think, an interesting rethinking of where Coates is borrowing from. Um, because I would suggest that this notion and the centrality of the black women's body um, in political theory certainly goes back to the mid-19th century and someone like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who is not only acutely aware, um, expressly invokes um, the problem of her body um, in the nation at the midst of the 19th century. But it has a different inflection than does Coates, because um, while the black woman's body is a troubled place, um, it is a site of um, discrimination, it is a site of sexual violence. Um, this falls out, by and large, I think, in Coates's analysis. But it is also, I think, in many of these women's readings, a site of possibility, right? It's, there is a conceit, um, even in the mid-19th century, in Frances Ellen Watkins Harper's writings, there is a conceit about the black woman's body, about that crossroads, about that intersectional space that she would argue makes her um, the superior right, um, observer, right, the superior ana analyst of inequality in the nation at the midst of the 19th century, precisely because she um, experiences it um, at that intersection. Um, she suggests that neither um, no man um, and um, no white woman uh, can quite think thoroughly, understand um, in a complex enough way um, what it is um, to be a member of the body politic, what the body politic is intended to um, embody ideally um, better than a black woman can. Um, so for Coates, I think, right, a lot of that possibility, right, and that, um, and that, um, um, insightful, right, um, possibilities of the black body fall out, um, I think, as we see the black body in his analysis coming, becoming a site of violence. And I'll think more about your question and the ways in which we might come back then to use this to rethink um, what's left out of um, his ideas in Between the World and Me. But um, I thank you very much for making the connection. It's excellent. Thanks for the talk, I enjoyed it and I learned a lot. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question about Mark Lilla because one response, about? Mark Lilla, mm -hmm. you may know that he wrote that uh, piece in the New York Times, The End of Identity Liberalism. And I was sitting there thinking while you were talking, what would Mark Lilla say in response to this talk? And I think what he would say is the kind of tortured negotiation between racial identity and gender identity and the talk of intersectionality is itself an expression of the identity politics that has really wrecked liberalism and has gotten the Democratic Party and the liberal movement, to, to use a, a phrase I don't know that he would use, uh, into trouble. And I wonder, that's obviously a hostile reading of what you uh, just wrote about, and I wonder how you would respond to that kind of comment, which is not mine. Yep. I'm projecting on a Lilla, but. Um. No, it's a, it, thank you for that very much. Um, well, partly because um, I'm a historian, um, I'll come back to my sources and tell you, right, that um, I don't think that the intervention is um, uh, intended um, to fuel right, the kind of tortured circumstances that Lilla might point to. I think instead, um, these are women who believe that their vantage point 
that we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity vision that Francis Ellen Watkins Harper offers us <coughs> up, right, is the way forward, right? That the way forward is partly through understanding, right, these dichotomies, these differences, these tensions, um, but it's not the ending place for these women at all. You hear Winfrey, right, who says, you have to understand all this about me, right, and then you have to put it aside. And in her um, nomenclature, that's about being an American. Um, in Watkins Walken, Harper's view, that's about, um, about humanity, right, and a kind of universalism. So I think it would be a misreading or it would be a truncated reading of these women to understand them as somehow doubling down, right, or reinforcing or somehow simply investing in a crude or fractious identity politics at all. What they're saying is you have to come through this, right? You have to come through who I am, but actually who I am is someone who offers up um, if not a unique, a particular perspective um, that has actually big tent, um, that actually is looking for, reaching for universal ideas um, that frankly transcend party politics um, oftentimes in their framing um, in addition to identity politics. So I think it's a truncated reading or it's an, it's an emphasis that I think is unwarranted because none of these folks, I didn't talk about um, Condoleezza Rice here, but I could, because um, Rice, um, on the day after, some of you maybe remember, holds a press conference or her daily briefing at the State Department the day after President Obama is elected. And uh, she takes the podium, which is not ordinary at the State Department briefing. And she, too, offers up this view that says, you have to come through me as a black woman to understand how I see this moment, but this moment is about us as Americans. And it's that move that I think these women are offering us that I think is actually um, not tortured at all. I think it's um, profoundly optimistic and um, broad in its framing. So that might be my response. Thank you for the question. Uh, thanks for a great talk. <clears throat> so. I really liked your conclusion in sort of grappling with the methodological implications of a black women's intellectual history. And I think it speaks to the serious tension in how intellectual history is done or thought about right now. Because mid-century, mid-20th century, um, intellectual history was sort of at its peak along with political history. This is in the work of people like Louis Hart or Hartz or um, Richard Hofstetter and intellectual history indeed was the sort of um, e exploration of elite thought, mostly white male. And so what you're doing is bringing black women into this um, field, which is a sort of, um, is different but not really different because Michelle Obama and the other women you talk about are indeed elite. Um, but then you talk about the sort of questioning the archive. And I see that happening in the um, sort of problem of trying to understand whether or not Harriet Tubman said the things that Clinton said she said. And this is the problem. So intellectual history now, many of us want, want it to be not just the exploration of sort of recorded thought of elite people, but we all as humans think and process the world through thought. But how do you study that? Um, because obviously it was a problem in trying to understand an intellectual history of Harriet Tubman. So that's, I mean, I guess you concluded there and you left it open as a sort of problem, but maybe if you could talk more about how we, under, how we sort of get beyond this problem, how we fix this problem. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. Um, um, I really do mean it as a question or a provocation at this juncture um, because I think you're right to point out um, the challenges of the archives, though I think that's nothing new, right, for our field in some ways. And one of the um, origin points for this project overall was a a course I had taken um, in graduate school with uh, Manning Marable, 
And Marable taught in the mid-1990s a course on black intellectuals. And uh, there was um, one woman on the syllabus. I feel like I should pause and make you guess who it was. There was one, only one. Um, and it was Bell Hooks. And Hooks is a formidable figure. She certainly um, should have been on that syllabus. But it was just one. And um, so there is a way in which um, we began trying to respond, or I began this project trying to respond to Marable, and Marable was doing two things in that course, right? On the one hand, he was recovering um, the thought of elite black men, Du Bois, Washington, you can imagine the litany. Um, and he was trying to situate himself, right? He was situating himself in that pantheon. Um, and in some sense, um, women were um, marginal, if not dispensable, there. Um, and I think when we came to this project, we, um, by and large, um, in trying to respond to Marable, did much the same thing, right? We, um, we chose the archives that chose us, right? Um, my colleague Sherry Randolph writes about um, the lawyer and activist uh, Flo Kennedy, Florence Kennedy. Well, Kennedy um, left uh, a, a massive archive, um, very carefully curated, such that the historian um, might be led or misled, right, to write her life story um, and to analyze her ideas in the way Kennedy wanted to be remembered. There are lots of figures like that. Um, and I think that um, it really is an, a question for the afterlife of this project. Um, how do we, should we, um, by what tools will we go um, looking for um, the ideas of more ordinary people? Um, but I really, and, um, I would say um, this vignette about Tubman um, isn't quite fair, right, to um, thinking about even um, a fictional quatrain is some um, byproduct of the intellectual um, uh, life of someone like Harriet Tubman. Um, I think we could work with that material and more, so it's not so strange to us. Um, my, really qu my real question is whether um, when we do that, um, we don't in some ways um, curiously um, delegitimize or demote Tubman, right? She's a, she's, a, she's a champion for the grassroots, right? She's a champion for the subaltern. Um, and to turn her into a person of ideas, a thinker, to situate her in Marable's pantheon in some ways is to um, undercut that sort of project that African American women's history has long been devoted to. So I don't really have an answer for you, but it's to say I do think it's sort of one of the next um, uh, challenges for this project, um, for the work that Chris Cameron's African American um, Intellectual His um, History Society does is what happens when we begin to elevate people um, to regard them and to understand them, to explain them as intellectuals. Um, is there anything left to that kind of grassroots subaltern project that for such a long time animated our field? Um, maybe yes, but maybe no. But that's really a very different kind of intellectual history. I think even more so than the the intervention of you know more more women, more people of color. So thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful way to start a Saturday morning. And I hope you don't mind if we continue this particular part of the conversation a little bit more, because I was incredibly struck by that Tubman story and the way in which voice equals leadership, equals elite, and if you don't have the voice, if you hadn't said it or written it, then you aren't, you know, then, then you get erased, perhaps, from history. And so I'm wondering about, one, how you tell the story of leaders who aren't necessarily capturing their leadership in a speech, in a piece of writing. And then I'm wondering also about, so I'm a political theorist, and so, uh, you know, thinking about the, the language of political actor and leader, 
right? That's all, those terms also, I think, do that work of demanding of subjects that they behave in a certain way, look a certain way, um, act a certain way in ways that will then, again, erase that everyday activism. Um, so I think it partly I'm asking you, like, how do you tell those stories and to what extent do we need maybe a different vocabulary when we bring people particularly into the realm of, of politics, when we want to, you know, offer them up as leaders, but again, sort of challenge the notion of leadership. So I, I just, it's another invitation to think, this, think some of these things through. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think there's a very, um, uh, you know, um, methodological answer to your question um, that, um, as I've already suggested, is not a new one for us. Um, how do I read um, against the grain um, what folks said about Tubman, um, uh, what was written about her, um, what she did um, as reflections of what she thought. I think these are um, important um, and important possibilities. And one of the experience of working on this project was to watch um, historians, um, literary scholars, um, come back to familiar archives to ask a new question, which was um, not only what were women doing, um, but what were they thinking? What sorts of ideas were they producing? So in some ways, um, it's an old insight that I take from uh, historian Marion Ryan, right? Which is, you know, we go back to the archives we know, and it turns out women are there um, telling us directly, indirectly, um, what they thought. Um, and so I think we can, that's a methodological question. Um, I think that um, the term that's most, been most provocative for me um, is um, not leader, though I, I'd like to think more about that. It is the term intellectual. Who is an intellectual? Um, and um, one of my reflections um, that actually Chris Cameron's blog let me write about um, after this uh, uh, book uh, came out um, was about this question for myself and for the other uh, scholars who worked on this project. Part of what this work generated was a question for ourselves about whether we thought we were intellectuals. And why is the notion, the idea, the term intellectual um, such a refined and um, oftentimes inaccessible one? What would it mean to rebrand ourselves um, rather than academics or scholars or historians, literary critics? What if we termed ourselves intellectuals? And this for me is part of the stakes and the bridge between this historical work and that blogosphere and women like Michelle Obama, um, which is that in the interrogation of um, black women's intellectual pasts, um, we perhaps unwittingly pose a question to ourselves about what it means to be and to term ourselves intellectuals. Um, Marable was a, a dear and um, powerful mentor to me. Um, if you know anything about him, um, you probably imagine that he never had much in the way of qualms, at least publicly, about claiming himself to be an intellectual and be um, and expects and probably is on that syllabus today, right, um, of black intellectuals in many places. Um, but we found um, those of us who came of age in the 80s and the 90s, in the early part of the 21st century, um, that is women um, and women of color, um, that that was not a frame, um, that intellectuals was somebody else's framework um, intellectual was someone else's sort of terrain. Um, I think it goes back to Andrew, Andrew Hartman's um, point, right, that we had um, inherited a set of ideas that included um, the vision of the intellectual as a, a, a white man, certainly a man. Um, and that's been a great, I think, challenge for us um, to think about then um, the, uh, the value, um, but also the, uh, the conceit in um, wanting to claim that sort of space for ourselves and offer it up to 
um, a next generation of scholars who are doing the same work. So I will think more about the leadership question, but I will say that the intellectual has been the thorniest um, of monikers for me in working on this. So thank you for the question. We will take this last question. We're going to finish up with about five minutes. Great. Thanks, Anna. All right, thank you so much for your presentation and, and good morning to everybody. I was sensitive to, uh, to the sister's comment about uh, who is in the room. Uh, I thought that was a very insightful comment, but I, I would have also said the same thing yesterday. Who is in the room as we talk about politics and progressive and conservative? I would have said the same thing. And, and I'd also, uh, since I got the microphone, remind people uh, who read this morning, uh, the officer who shot Jordan Edwards uh, was charged uh, with murder. Uh, and so when we were invoking Ta-Nehisi Coates' uh, work uh, and his thoughts, uh, I think that that's, that's worth noting uh, all in. I was fascinated by your discussion of, uh, of the inability to, to, to or, or the troubles that, that people are having moving away from just elite uh, thoughts uh, about African American women's intellectual history. Uh, and I was wondering, I thought in terms of Michelle Obama in particular, uh, there was to me uh, a tie to not not necessarily as far back as, as, as Harriet Tubman, but, but uh, maybe Angela Davis, maybe, uh, you know, maybe Elaine Brown or, or Gloria Richardson and, and, and these kinds of people, Asada Shakur. Uh, I remember the, the article and the picture of uh, Michelle Obama as, as a, a radical militant uh, kind of thing. And so uh, in reading her, her, her thesis, uh, there was a, a certain consciousness about her. And I'm wondering if those, those figures, maybe they weren't intellectuals, influenced her as much as, say, uh, going back to, to, to Harriet Tubman. And I was wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, specifically on Mrs. Obama, I, I think that's um, a history, a story yet to be written. Um, you know, Peter Slevin has written a, a wonderful um, biography of Mrs. Modern biography of Mrs. Obama. Uh, Rachel Swains has written um, about Mrs. Obama's sort of family history, um, and I myself was um, uh, surprised that when um, it was um, discovered or revealed that. Um, Mrs. Trump's uh, speechwriters had borrowed from Mrs. Obama's 2008 speech, um, that folks were discovering that 2008 speech for the first time. Um, which is to say that um, there's more thinking to do, I think, about Mrs. Obama um, as a thinker, right? as an intellectual, as a political theorist. What is the political theory of um, when they go low, we go high. Um, that is, I think, worth understanding and uncovering. So I'm not sure it will be my work, um, but I think it is a reflection of um, what we were attempting to draw attention to with this project, um, which is that th there are many frames for thinking about Mrs. Obama, but we have been reluctant to offer up the notion that um, part of who she is is a thinker, um, a theorizer, um, an intellectual, um, though surely she is one who is able to um, package and present um, and translate very sophisticated ideas um, for a broad body politic. That's what we saw in this last election cycle, in fact, right, was her capacity to take those ideas um, and to offer them up in ways that very sophisticated ideas that make them speak um, to broad audiences. Um, I just think that work hasn't been done um, because we don't have, um, I think, um, well enough in place um, the notion that um, black women are many things 
um, including the producers of ideas. So I look forward to that essay about um, when they go low, we go high, um, and understanding the genealogy of that idea, because I imagine um, it's a complicated one. So thank you very much for the question, and thanks, everybody.